St. Thomas Aquinas, Part 4 When the moderns, drawing the blackest curtain of obscuritism that ever obscured history, deciding that nothing mattered much before the Renaissance and the Reformation, they instantly began their modern career by falling into a big blunder. It was the blunder about Platonism. They found, hanging about the courts of the swaggering princes of the sixteenth century, which was as far back in history as they are allowed to go, certain anti-clerical artists and scholars who said they were bored with Aristotle and were supposed to be secretly indulging in Plato. The moderns, utterly ignorant of the whole story of the medievals, instantly fell into the trap. They assumed that Aristotle was some crabbed antiquity and tyranny from the black back of the Dark Ages, and that Plato was an entirely new pagan pleasure never yet tasted by Christian men. Father Knox has shown in what a startling state of innocence is the mind of Mr. H. L. Mencken, for example, upon this point. In fact, of course, the story is exactly the other way around. If anything, it was Platonism that was the old orthodoxy. It was Aristotleanism that was very modern revolution. And the leader of that modern revolution was the man who is the subject of this book. The truth is that the historical Catholic Church began by being Platonist by being rather two Platonists. Platonism was in that golden Greek air that was breathed by the first great Greek theologians. The Christian fathers were much more like the Neoplatonists than were the scholars of the Renaissance, who were only Neo-Neoplatonists. For Christostom, or Basil, it was as ordinary to think in terms of the Logos, or the Wisdom, which is the aim of the philosophers, as it is to any men of any religion today to talk about social problems, or progress, or the economic crisis throughout the world. St. Augustine followed a natural mental evolution when he was a Platonist before he was a Manichaean and a Manichaean before he was a Christian. It was exactly in that last association that the first faint hint of the danger of being too Platonist may be seen. From the Renaissance to the 19th century, the moderns have had an almost monstrous love of the ancients. In considering medieval life, they could never regard the Christians as anything but the pupils of the pagans, of Plato and ideas, of Aristotle and reason and science. It was not so. On some points, even from the most monotonously modern standpoint, Catholicism was centuries ahead of Platonism and Aristotelianism. We can see it still, for instance, in the tiresome tenacity of astrology. On that matter, the philosophers were all in favor of superstition, and the saints and all such superstitious people were against superstition. But even the great saints found it difficult to get disentangled from this superstition. Two points were always put by those suspicious of the Aristotelianism of Aquinas, and they sound to us now very quaint and comic, taken together. One was the view that the stars are personal beings governing our lives. The other, the great general theory that men have one mind between them 
a view obviously opposed to immortality, that is, to individuality. Both linger among the moderns. So strong is still the tyranny of the ancients. Astrology sprawls over the Sunday papers, and the other doctrine has its hundredth form in what is called communism, or the soul of the hive. For on one preliminary point, this position must not be misunderstood. When we praise the practical value of the Aristotelian er revolution and the originality of Aquinas in leading it, we do not mean that the scholastic philosophers before him had not been philosophers, or had not been highly philosophical, or had not been in touch with ancient philosophy. Insofar as there was ever a bad break in philosophical history, it was not before St. Thomas, or at the beginning of medieval history. It was after St. Thomas, and at the beginning of modern history. The great intellectual tradition that comes down to us from Pythagoras and Plato was never interrupted or lost through such trifles as the sack of Rome the triumph of Attila, or all the barbarian invasions of the Dark Ages. It was only lost after the introduction of printing, the discovery of America, the founding of the Royal Society, and all the enlightenment of the Renaissance and the modern world. It was there, if anywhere, that there was lost or impatiently snapped the long, thin, delicate thread that had descended from distant antiquity, the thread of that unusual human hobby, the habit of thinking. This is proved by the fact that the printed books of this later period largely had to wait for the 18th century, or the end of the 17th century, to find even the names of the new philosophers, who were, at the best, a new kind of philosophers. But the decline of the empire, the Dark Ages, and the early Middle Ages, though too much tempted to neglect what was opposed to Platonic philosophy, had never neglected philosophy. In that sense, St. Thomas, like most other very original men, has a long and clear pedigree. He himself is constantly referring back to authorities from St. Augustine to St. Anselm, and from St. Anselm to St. Albert, and even when he differs, he also defers. A very learned Anglican once said to me, not perhaps without a touch of tartness. I can't understand why everybody talks as if St. Thomas, Aquinas, were the beginning of the scholastic philosophy. I could understand their saying he was the end of it. Whether or no the comment was meant to be tart, we may be sure that the reply of St. Thomas would have been perfectly urbane and indeed it would be easy to answer with a certain placidity that in his Tom Thomas language the end of a thing does not mean its destruction but its fulfillment no Thomist will complain if Thomism is the end of our philosophy in the sense in which God is the end of our existence for that does not mean that we cease to exist but that we become as perennial as the Philosophia Perennis. Putting this claim on one side, however, it is important to remember that my distinguished interlocutor was perfectly right, in that there had been whole dynasties of doctrinal philosophers before Aquinas leading up to the day of the great revolt of the Aristotelians. Nor was even that revolt a thing entire 
slightly abrupt and unforeseen. An able writer in the Dublin Review not long ago pointed out that in some respects the whole nature of metaphysics had long advanced a long way since Aristotle, by the time it came to Aquinas. In that it is no disrespect to the primitive and gigantic genius of the stag Stagorite to say in some respects that he was really but a rude and rough founder of philosophy, compared with some of the subsequent subtleties of medievalism, that the Greek gave a few grand hints which the scholastics developed into the most delicate fine shades. This may be an overstatement, but there is a truth in it. Anyhow, it is certain that even in Aristotle and philosophy, let alone Platonic philosophy, there was already a tradition of highly intelligent interpretation. If that delicacy afterwards degenerated into hair-splitting, it was nonetheless delicate hair-splitting, and the work requiring very scientific tools. What made the Aristotelian revolution really revolutionary was the fact that it was really religious. It is the fact so fundamental that I thought it well to lay it down in the first few pages of this book that the revolt was largely a revolt of the most Christian elements in Christendom. St. Thomas, every bit as much as St. Francis, felt subconsciously that the hold of his people was slipping on the solid Catholic doctrine and discipline, worn smooth by more than a thousand years of routine, and that the faith needed to be shown under a new light and dealt with from another angle. But he had no motive except the desire to make it popular for the salvation of people. It was true, broadly speaking, that for some time past it had been too Platonist to be popular. It needed something like the shrewd and homely touch of Aristotle to turn it again into a religion of common sense. Both the motive and the method are illustrated in the war of Aquinas against the Augustinians. First, it must be remembered that the Greek influence continued to flow from the Greek Empire, or at least from the center of the Roman Empire, which was the Greek city of Byzantium, and no longer in Rome. That influence was Byzantine in every good and bad sense. Like Byzantine art, it was severe and mathematical and a little terrible. Like Byzantine etiquette, it was oriental and faintly decadent. We owe to the learning of Mr. Christopher Dawson much enlightenment upon the way in which Byzantium slowly stiffened into a sort of Asiatic theocracy, more like that which served the sacred emperor in China. But even the unlearned can see the difference in the way in which Eastern Christianity flattened everything, as it flattened the faces of the image into icons. It became a thing of patterns rather than pictures, and it made definite and destructive war upon statues. Thus we see, strangely enough, that the East was the land of the cross, and the West was the land of the crucifix. The Greeks were being dehumanized by a radiant symbol, while the Goths were being humanized by an in instrument of torture. Only the West made realistic pictures of the greatest of the, all the tales out of the East. Hence the Greek element in Christian theology tended more and more to be a sort of dried-up Platonism, a thing of diagrams and abstractions to the last, indeed, noble distractions, but not sufficiently touched by that great thing that is, by definition, almost the opposite of abstraction, incarnation.
Their logos was the word, but not the word made flesh. In a thousand very subtle ways, often escaping doctrinal definition, this spirit spread over the world of Christendom from the place where the sacred emperor sat under his golden mosaics and the flat pavement of the Roman Empire was at last a sort of smooth pathway for Muhammad. For Islam was the ultimate fulfillment of the iconoclasts. Long before that, however, there was this tendency to make the cross merely decorative, like the crescent, to make it a pattern like the Greek key or the wheel of Buddha, but there is something passive about such a world of patterns, and the Greek key does not open any door, while the wheel of Buddha moves round and never moves on. Partly through these negative influences, partly through a necessary and noble asceticism which sought to emulate the awful standard of the martyrs, the earlier Christian ages have been excessively anti-corporal and too near the danger line of Manichaean mysticism. But there was a far less danger in the fact that the saints macerated the body than in the fact that the sages neglected it. Granted all the grandeur of Augustine's contribution to Christianity, there was, in a sense, a more subtle danger in Augustine, the Platonist, than even in Augustine, the Manichae. There came from it a mood which unconsciously committed the heresy of dividing the substance of the Trinity. It thought of God too exclusively as a spirit who purifies, or a savior who redeems and too little as a creator who creates. That is why men like Aquinas thought it right to correct Plato by an appeal to Aristotle. Aristotle, who took things as he found them, just as Aquinas accepted things as God created them. In all the works of St. Thomas, the world of positive creation is perpetually present. Humanly speaking, it was he who saved the human element in Christian theology, if he used for convenience certain elements in heathen philosophy. Only, as he had already been urged, the human element is also a Christian one. The panic upon the Aristotelian peril that had passed across the high places of the church was probably a dry wind from the desert. It was really filled rather with fear of Muhammad than fear of Aristotle. And this was ironic because there was really much more difficulty in reconciling Aristotle with Muhammad than in reconciling him with Christ. Islam is essentially a simple creed for simple men and nobody can ever really turn pantheism into a simple creed. It is at once too abstract and too complicated. There are simple believers in a personal God, and there are atheists more simple-minded than any believers in a personal God. But few can, in mere simplicity, accept a godless universe as a God. And while the Moslem as compared with the Christian, had perhaps a less human God, he had, if possible, a more personal God. The will of Allah was very much of a will, and could not be turned into a stream of tendency. On all that cosmic and abstract side, the Catholic was more accommodating than the Moslem, up to a point. The Catholic could admit at least that Aristotle was right about the impersonal elements of a personal God. Hence, we may say broadly of the Moslem philosophers,
that those who became good philosophers became bad Muslims. It is not altogether unnatural that many bishops and doctors feared that the Thomists might become good philosophers and bad Christians. But there were also many of the strict school of Plato and Augustine who stoutly denied that they were even good philosophers. Between those rather incongruous passions, the love of Plato and the fear of Muhammad, there was a moment when the prospects of er any Aristotle in culture and Christendom looked very dark indeed. Anathema after anathema was thundered from high places, and under the shadow of the persecution, as so often happens, it seems for a moment that barely one or two figures alone in the storm-swept area. They were both in the black and white of the Dominicans, for Albertus and Aquinas stood firm. In that sort of combat there is always confusion, and majorities change into minorities and back again as if by magic. It is always difficult to date the turn of the tide, which seems to be a welter of eddies, the very dates seeming to overlap and confuse the crisis. But the change from the moment when the two Dominicans stood alone to the moment when the whole church at last wheeled into line with them may perhaps be found at about the moment when they were practically brought before a hostile but a not unjust judge. Stephen Tempier, the Bishop of Paris, was apparently a rather fine specimen of the old fanatical churchman who thought that admiring Aristotle was a weakness likely to be followed by adoring Apollo. He was also, by a piece of bad luck, one of the old social conservatives, who had intensely resented the popular revolution of the preaching friars. But he was an honest man, and St. Th St. Thomas never asked for anything but permission to address to honest men. All around him were other Aristotle and revolutionaries of a much more dubious sort. There was Seeger, the sophist from Brabant, who learned all his Aristotelianism from the Arabs, and had an ingenious theory about how an Arabian agnostic could also be a Christian. There were a thousand young men of the sort that had shouted for Abelard, full of the youth of the thirteenth century and drunken with the Greek wine of Stagira. Over against them, lowering the implacable, was the old Puritan party of the Augustinians, only too del delighted to class the rationalistic Albert and Thomas with equivocal Moslem metaphysicians. It would seem that the triumph of Thomas was really a personal triumph. He withdrew not a single one of his propositions, though it is said that the reactionary bishop did con condemn some of them after his death. On the whole, however, Aquinas convinced most of his critics that he was quite as good a Catholic as they were. There was a sequel of squabbles between the religious orders, following upon this controversial crisis. But it is probably true to say that the fact that a man like Aquinas had managed even partially to satisfy a man like Tempier was at the end of the essential quarrel. What was already familiar to the few became familiar to the many. That an Aristotelian could really be a Christian. Another fact assisted assisted in the common conversation. It was rather curiously resembles the story of the translation of the Bible. 
and the alleged Catholic suppression of the Bible. Behind the scenes, where the Pope was much more tolerant than the Paris bishop, the friends of Aquinas had been hard at work producing a new translation of Aristotle. It demonstrated that in many ways the heretical translation had been a very, a very heretical translation. With the final consummation of this work, we may say that the great Greek f philosophy entered finally into the system of Christendom. The process had been half humorously described as the baptism of Aristotle. We have all heard of the humility of the men of science, of many who were genuinely humble, and some who were very proud of their humility. It will be the somewhat too recurrent burden of this study that St. Thomas really did have the humility of the man of science as a special variant of the humi humility of the saint. It is true that he did not himself contribute anything concrete in the experiment or detail of physical science. In this, it may be said, he even lagged behind the last generation, and was far less of an experimental scientist than his tutor, Albertus Magnus. But for all that, he was historically a great friend to the freedom of science. The principles he laid down, properly understood, are perhaps the best that can be produced for protecting science from mere obscurantist persecution. For instance, in the matter of the inspiration of scripture, he fixed first on the obvious fact which was forgotten by four furious centuries of sectarian battle, that the meaning of scripture was very far from self-evident, and that we must often interpret it in the light of other truths. If a literal interpretation is really and flatly contradicted by an obvious fact, why then we can only say that the literal interpretation must be a false interpretation. But the fact must really be an obvious fact. And, unfortunately, 19th century scientists were just as ready to jump to the conclusion that any guess about nature was an obvious fact as were 17th century sectarians to jump to the conclusion that any guess about scripture was the obvious explanation. Thus, private theories about what the Bible ought to mean, and premature theories about what the world ought to mean, have met in a loud and widely advertised controversy, especially in the Victorian time, in this clumsy collision of two very impatient forms of ignorance was known as the quarrel of science and religion. But St. Thomas had the scientific humility in this very vivid and special sense, that he was ready to take the lowest place, for the examination of the lowest things. He did not, like a modern specialist, study the worm as if it were the world, but he was willing to begin to study the reality of the world in the reality of the worm. His Aristotelianism simply meant that the study of this humblest fact will lead to the study of the highest truth. That for him the process was logical and not biological, was concerned with philosophy rather than science, does not alter the essential idea that he believed in the beginning at the bottom of the ladder. But he also gave, in his view of scripture and science, and other questions, a sort of charter for pioneers more purely practical than himself. He practically said that if they could really prove their practical discoveries, the traditional interpretation of scripture 
must give way before those discoveries. He could hardly, as the common phrase goes, say fairer than that. If the matter had been left to him, and men like him, there never would have been any quarrel between science and religion. He did his very best to map out two provinces for them, and to trace just a just frontier between them. It is often cheerfully remarked that Christianity has failed, by which is meant that it has never had that sweeping, imperial, and imposed supremacy which has belonged to each of the great revolutions, every one of which has subsequently failed. There was never a moment when men could say that every man was a Christian, as they might say for several months that every man was a royalist, or a republican, or a communist. But if sane historians want to understand the sense in which the Christian character has succeeded, they could not find a better case than the massive moral pressure of a man like St. Thomas in support of the buried rationalism of the heathens, which had as yet only been dug up for the amusement of the heretics. It was, quite strictly and exactly, because a new kind of man was conducting rational inquiry in a new kind of way, that men forgot the curse that had fallen on the temples of the dead demons and the palaces of the dead despots, forgot even the new fury out of Arabia against which they were fighting for their lives. Because the man who was asking them to return to sense, or return to their senses, was not a sophist, but a saint. Aristotle had described the magnanimous man, who is great and knows that he is great. But Aristotle would never have recovered his own greatness, but for the miracle that created the more magnanimous man, who is great and knows that he is small. There is a certain historical importance in what some would call the heaviness of the style employed. It carries a curious impression of candor, which really did have, I think, a considerable effect upon contemporaries. The saint has sometimes been called a, sept a skeptic. The truth is that he was very largely tolerated as a skeptic because he was obviously a saint. But when he seemed to stand up as a stubborn Aristotelian, hardly distinguishable from the Arab Arabian heretics, I do seriously believe that what protected him was very largely the prodigious power of his simplicity and the obvious goodness and love of truth. Those who went out against the haughty confidence of the heretics were stopped and brought up all standing against a sort of huge humility which was like a mountain, or perhaps like that immense valley that is the mold of a mountain. Allowing for all medieval conventions, one can feel that the other innovators, this was not always so. The others, from Abelard down to Sigur of Brabant, have never quite lost, in the long process of history, a faint air of showing off. Nobody could feel for a moment that Thomas Aquinas was showing off. The very dullness of diction, of which some complain, was enormously convincing. He could have given wit as well as wisdom, but he was so prodigiously in earnest that he gave his wisdom without his wit. After the hour of triumph came the moment of peril. It is always so with alliances, especially because Aquinas was fighting on two fronts, 
His main business was defend the faith against the abuse of Aristotle, and he boldly did it by supporting the use of Aristotle. He knew perfectly well that armies of atheists and anarchists were roaring applause in the background at his Aristotelian victory over all he held most dear. Nevertheless, it was never the existence of atheists, any more than Arabs or Aristotelian pagans, that disturbed the extraordinary controversial composure of Thomas Aquinas. The real peril that followed on the victory he had won for Aristotle was vividly presented in the curious case of Seeger of Brabant. It is well worth study for anyone who would begin to comprehend the strange history of Christendom. It is marked by one rather queer quality, which has always been the unique note of the faith. Though it is not noticed by its modern enemies, and rarely by its modern friends. It is the fact symbolized in the legend of Antichrist, who was the double of Christ, in the profound proverb that the devil is the ape of God. It is the fact that falsehood is never so false as when it is very nearly true. It is when the stab comes near the nerve of truth that the Christian conscience cries out in pain. And Seeger of Brabant, following on some of the Arabian Aristotelians, advanced a theory which most modern newspaper readers would have instantly declared to be the same as the theory of St. Thomas. That was what finally roused St. Thomas to his last and most emphatic protest. He had won his battle for a wide scope of philosophy and science. He had cleared the ground for a general understanding about faith and inquiry, an understanding that has generally been observed among Catholics, and certainly never deserted without disaster. It was the idea that the scientist should go on exploring and experimenting freely, so long as he did not claim an infallibility and finality which was against his own principles to claim. Meanwhile, the Church should go on developing and defining about supernatural things, so long as he did not claim a right to alter the deposit of faith, which it was against her own principles to claim. And when he had said this, Seeger of Brabant got up and said something so horribly like it and so horribly unlike that, like the Antichrist, he might have deceived the very elect. Seeger of Brabant said this, The Church must be right theologically, but she can be wrong scientifically. There are two truths the truth of the supernatural world and the truth of the natural world, which contradicts the supernatural world. While we are being naturalists, we can suppose that Christianity is all nonsense. But then, when we remember that we are Christians, we must admit that Christianity is true, even if it is nonsense. In other words, Seeger Brabant split the human head in two, like the blow in an old legend of battle, and declared that a man has two minds, with one of which he must entirely believe, and with the other he may utterly disbelieve. To many this would at least seem like a parody of Thomism. As a fact, it was the assassination of Thomism. It was not two ways of finding the same truth. It was an untruthful way of pretending that there are two truths. And it is extraordinarily interesting to note that this is one occasion when the dumb ox really came out like a wild bull. When he stood up to answer Seeger of Brabant, he was altogether transfigured, 
and the very style of his sentences, which is a thing like the tone of a man's voice, is suddenly altered. He had never been angry with any of the enemies who disagreed with him, but these enemies had attempted the worst treachery. They had made him agree with them. Those who complain that the theologians draw fine distinctions could hardly find a better example of their own folly. In fact, a fine distinction can be a flat contradiction. It was notably so in this case. St. Thomas was willing to allow the one truth to be approached by two paths, precisely because he was sure there was only one truth. Because the faith was the one truth, nothing discovered in nature could ultimately contra contradict the faith. Because the faith was the one truth, nothing really deduced from the faith could ultimately contradict the facts. It was, in truth, a curiously daring confidence in the reality of his religion. And though some may linger to dispute it, it has been justified. The scientific facts, which were supposed to contradict the faith in the 19th century, are nearly all of them regarded as unscientific fictions in the 20th century. Even the materialists had fled from materialism, and those who lectured us about determinism in psychology were already talking about indeterminism in matter. But whether his confidence was right or wrong, it was specially and supremely a confidence that there is one truth which cannot contradict itself. And this last group of enemies suddenly sprang up, to tell him they largely agreed with him in saying that there are two contradictory truths. Truth, in the medieval phrase, carried two faces under one hood, and these double-faced sophists practically dared to suggest that it was the Dominican hood. So, in his last battle, and for the first time, he fought as with a battle-axe, there is a ring in the words altogether beyond the almost impersonal patience he maintained in debate with so many enemies. Behold our refutation of the error. It is not based on documents of faith, but on the reasons and statements of the philosophers themselves. If anyone there be who, boastfully taking pride in his supposed wisdom, wishes to challenge what we have written, let him not do it in some corner, nor before children who are powerless to, to decide on such difficult matters. Let him openly reply, if he dare. He shall find me then confronting him, and not only my negligible self, but many another whose duty is truth. We shall do battle with his errors, or bring a cure to his ignorance. The dumb ox is bellowing now, like one at bay, and yet terrible and towering over all the baying pack. We have already noted why, in this one quarrel with Sigur of Brabant, Thomas Aquinas let loose such thunders of purely moral passion. It was because the whole work of his life was being betrayed behind his back by those who had used his victories over the reactionaries. The point at that moment is that this is perhaps his one moment of personal passion, save for a single flash in the troubles of his youth, and he is once more fighting his enemies with a firebrand. And yet, even in this isolated apocalypse of anger, there is one phrase that may be commended for all time to men who are angry which must, with much less cause. If there is one sentence that could be carved in marble, as representing the calmest and most enduring rationality of his unique intelligence, it is a sentence which came pouring out in 
with all the rest of this molten lava. If there is one phrase that stands before history as typical of Thomas Aquinas, it is that phrase about his own argument. It is not based on documents of faith, but on the reasons and statements of the philosophers themselves. Would that all orthodox doctors in deliberation were as reasonable as Aquinas in anger. Would that all Christian apologists would remain remember that maxim and write it up in large letters on the wall before they nail any theses there. At the top of his fury, Thomas Aquinas understands that so many defenders of orthodoxy will not understand. It is no good to tell an atheist that he is an atheist, or to charge a denier of immortality with the infamy of denying it, or to imagine that one can force an opponent to admit he is wrong by proving that he is wrong on somebody else's principles, but not on his own. After the great example of St. Thomas, the principle stands, or ought always to have stood established, and that we must either not argue with a man at all, or we must argue on his grounds and not ours. We may do other things instead of arguing, according to our views of what actions are morally permissible, but if we argue, we must argue on the reasons and statements of the philosophers themselves. This is the common sense in a saying attributed to a friend of St. Thomas, the great St. Louis, King of France, which shallow people quote as a sample of fanaticism, in sense of which is that I m must either argue with an infidel as a real philosopher can argue, or else thrust a sword through his body as far as it will go. A real philosopher, even of the opposite school, will be the first to agree that St. Louis was entirely philosophical. So, in the last great controversial crisis of his theological campaign, Thomas Aquinas contrived to give his friends and enemies not only a lesson in theology, but a lesson in controversy. But it was, in fact, his last controversy. He had been a man with a huge controversial appetite, a thing that exists in some men and not others, in saints and in sinners. But after this great and victorious duel with Sigur of Brabant, he was suddenly overwhelmed with a desire for silence and repose. He said one strange thing about his mood of his to a friend, which will fall into its more appropriate place elsewhere. He fell back on the extreme simplicities of his monastic round, and seemed to desire nothing but a sort of permanent retreat. A request came to him from the Pope that he should set out, upon some further mission of diplomacy or disputation, and he already would made ready to obey. But before he had gone many, files, my, many miles on his journey, he was dead. <laughs>